Welcome to episode three of District of Conservation, everyone. I'm going to discuss a lot of important things related to policy, updates from Washington, D.C., and across the country that'll be pretty detailed. So hop on for the ride and get excited. District of Conservation is sponsored by Real Camo Girl, a lifestyle brand for women who love the great outdoors. It's a safe space where women can share their pictures, their stories, wild game and fish recipes, and see the latest in terms of conservation policy and other women communicating their hunting perspectives. I've been involved since September 2016, a little over two years, as a pro staffer, and I cannot say enough about the organization. I've made some lifelong friends. We've gr- included a lot of women involved, pro staffers, not pro staffers, and it's a great space for those of you who are interested in learning more, regardless of your experience level. And it's a safe community against the antis, the people who don't like hunting or fishing, and you'll feel more than welcomed if you join. So check them out at realcamelgirl.com and follow them across social media. Episode three of District of Conservation. How exciting that we're progressing with each week. Thank you all who have been listening and providing feedback, positive, negative, mostly been positive. But I wanted to jump into this episode and discuss a lot of what transpired in Congress and across the country this last week. But first and foremost, if you guys didn't know, the federal judge in Montana who put a temporary halt on the grizzly bear hunt, the managed hunt, Judge Dana Christensen, the Obama appointee, he issued another injunction halting the managed grizzly bear hunt for another two weeks. And he says this, there remain serious questions whether or not U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service complied with the Administrative Procedure Act and Endangered Species Act in delisting the greater Yellowstone ecosystem grizzly bear population, he said on Thursday. If the court does not extend the temporary restraining order, as many as 23 bears may be killed in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Their death would cause irreparable injury to the plaintiffs. So... The judge's statement seems to be rooted in politics. No surprise there. And that and just his lack of understanding of what deli- what he what was surmised by the Fish and Wildlife Service last year in June, June 2017, that the grizzly bear population in this particular ecosystem comprising Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, that the bear in this particular part of the country has been restored to pretty healthy levels. In fact, surplus levels because they're going after livestock, elk, and pronghorn sheep and other things and causing a lot of disruption. So it's really silly that his political views, it appears, are taking over his judicial prudence. And I know groups like Safari Club International, National Rifle Association, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and Sportsman's Alliance, hopefully will, it is my hope, I'm not a lawyer, but I hope they file an amicus brief or a friend of the court brief to challenge this if this judge continues to play politics with interfering with wildlife management efforts. So that happened again, and that's a shame. It's interrupting the North American model of wildlife conservation, but I'll keep you guys posted if there are any more updates. But that really disappointed me, and I think a lot of other people in the conservation space this week but it was it needed to be communicated. So I'm happy to, to, to start that, but this stuff keeps happening and, and we have to keep a close watchful eye because this could go after other, uh, wild game, small or big game, whatever. So they're very serious about trying to cut hunting. A lot of these acolytes and judges, whether they're activist judges or activists themselves. And it's a shame. And let's hope that this can be stopped, but all of us need to band together and work with groups that are going to legally challenge this. So that's really important. I wanted to get that off my chest Another thing I wanted to discuss was the fact that the Department of Interior under Secretary Zinke has issued a review of federal hunting and fishing regulations this past Monday to see where federal standards can be shifted to mesh better with state wildlife and habitat laws. So this memo came out. It was released by this uh, very extremist environmental organization, which doesn't think that uh, funds from hunters and anglers should be applied to conservation. He couldn't be more patently false, but what this memo does or what it did actually has, it was sent out to the department of interior bureaus and offices, and they have 45 days to review cases where they believe federal law exceeds state regulations governing fish and wildlife management. So this memo briefly said the DUI recognizes states as the first line authorities for fish and wildlife management and hereby expresses its commitment to defer to the states in this regard, except as otherwise required by federal law. And the group that obtained this memo, the Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, PEER, their executive director, Jeff Rutch, 
condemned Zinke's memo, arguing that state policy decisions will be motivated by profits from hunting and fishing licenses rather than conservation. He says, this across the board abandonment of fish and wildlife safeguards, federal fish and wildlife safeguards, I should say, is rooted in an ideological stance unsupported by any factual analysis, Rauch said in a statement. Federal parks, preserves, and refuges have a mission to protect biodiversity and should not be reduced to game farms. So this individual, this Mr. Rutch guy, couldn't be more false. And it's really funny because people like him love to talk up a great talk about supporting conservation efforts, but they really don't have a legitimate stake in this game. The proof is in the pudding that environmentalists and some self proclaim conservationists freeload off of hunters and anglers who fund the majority of habitat and wildlife restoration efforts. So this, this individual is very short sighted. He does not obviously understand that current law already makes it. So hunters and anglers pay a large share into conservation funding. Can the same be said of individuals like him? I don't think so. And it seems to me, he claimed that this was a political motivation to make sure that States can better manage certain regulations with respect to hunting and fishing than federal. Uh, he couldn't, <laughs> it's obviously rooted in politics. It, I don't think he really likes this administration. You can tell. And I think hunters want to have, and anglers want to have fewer burdensome regulations placed upon them when they want to go hunting and fishing. They want to be aware of the laws in place, but they don't, don't want to have superfluous laws on top of existing law to make it impossible to go hunting and fishing. So I think this is a good move and I look forward to seeing this being implemented uh, when this memo goes into effect. The three critical pieces of legislation I want to touch upon came from the House Committee on Natural Resources this week. So if you guys are unaware of what this committee does, Congress has lots of committees, some good, some bad, but this one relates to our interests for those of you who go fishing, hunting, enjoy shooting sports or support outdoor recreation. They are tasked with considering legislation about American energy production, mineral lands and mining, fisheries and wildlife, public lands, oceans, Native American interests, irrigation and reclamation. This committee has 44 House members, primarily 25 Republicans and 18 Democrats. If you guys know how Congress is oriented, the majority party gets to retain the most members and committees. That's how it is. And I think it's good in this case, given my political predispositions, but that's a, an aside. However, the first bill that they passed was a bill to reform or modernize, I should say, the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937. So I alluded to this uh, just earlier, how hunters and anglers foot the bill for 60 to 80% of conservation funding in this country because of the licenses they purchase, the archery gear that they buy, the firearms, tackle, all that. So when you buy these sporting goods, you are going to pay excise taxes on this, of which 11% of your total expenditures will be collected by the Department of Interior, which later distributes those monies to your state fish and wildlife agency. Very simple. So this law has been fairly effective, but it doesn't address the shortcomings with trying to remedy the problem with hunting participation, for example. So this bill has hopes of doing that. Again, this is not the sole band-aid that is going to fix the problem with hunting participation, but it can do a lot. And when it was passed last week, Congressman Austin Scott, a Republican from Georgia's eighth district, who's the house vice chairman of congressional sportsman's caucus. He said the following about why he wanted this bill to pass. He said with the national decline in outdoor recreational activities, Pittman Robertson funds are shrinking and our state and local habitats are suffering, which is why I have been fighting to give States more flexibility in how they use their PR Pittman Robertson funds and hopefully attract more Americans to the outdoors in the process, said Rep. Scott. But now it has to be deliberated in the Senate if it gets heard there. Obviously, there's a lot of stalling in the Senate because there's a lot of partisanship there. There are fewer members. The House can streamline stuff a little easier. So when the Senate version comes to a foot, I'm going to do my best to report on this. But I think this is a good step. Again, with recruitment, retention, and reactivation, this empowers states to do a better job of recruiting and retaining and reactivating people because hunting has suffered, as you guys know, from that 2016 fish and wildlife service report that came out that said that we lost 2 million hunters. So a little legislation could go a long way to help us. And if you're skeptical, don't be skeptical. There's sometimes very small instances where government can do the right thing. And in this case they did. The second piece of legislation I want to discuss is the restore our parks and public lands act, which is HR 6510. And if you guys aren't already aware of this, 
the National Park Service, which is under the umbrella of the Department of Interior, is currently facing a $12 billion shortfall. And this has been building up across administration, Democrat, Republican over the years. And of course, there have been some instances of abuse, negligence and reckless spending. That's 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 stuff is to say stuff that has happened. But I think this administration is very serious in remedying this. So what this bill will do now that it has been passed is take royalties from energy production on federal lands and offshore drilling and apply half of that revenue from the federal government that they collect on such resources, I should say, they're going to take half of that revenue and apply it to the National Park Service and other agencies, including the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Education to help offset that backlog, which keeps building up. And there's no provision that raises taxes, nor does it increase spending. So I think that's pretty good for those of us who are fiscally conscious. That's an assurance we want to hear. And I think sportsmen should be keen on knowing that this doesn't tamper with taxes or spending. So it's good. So Rob Bishop had said, we have advocated and we have developed these properties in the past and that we have a moral responsibility to ensure that we maintain them and that we maintain what we have before we add to that burden. That's what this bill attempts to do. So his colleague, Representative Raul Grijalva, a, a Democrat from Arizona, also applauded the bill. And he said, we've repeat, heard repeatedly in this committee that the National Park System has nearly a 12 billion maintenance backlog. We've been talking about it for years and talking about dedicating funding specifically for the pr problem. And he says this bill provides it. So unusual bipartisan support for fixing the national parks. Everyone enjoys these national parks. We can say that when energy interests are well-intentioned and we can use the revenue from that to offset costs with conservation efforts. I think that's a win-win. Oftentimes the energy industry gets maligned and there are bad actors, of course, but a lot of their people go fishing and hunting and they don't want to dirty up or ruin the environment or our waterways uniformly. I think there are some bad actors who do, but to put a blanket statement on that and to, to broadly define that as the everyone there, that's wrong. So I'm glad this transpired and I think you guys will be too. And it, it goes to show that multiple parties can work together with that. The third piece of legislation I want to discuss that passed in the House Natural Resources Committee was the reauthorization of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which was originally passed in 1965. And I've seen this around. I honestly want to admit <laughs> that I really didn't know what the Land and Water Conservation Fund did. It seemed convoluted to me, so I never really paid attention, and I didn't realize the severity of the issue if it weren't to be reauthorized. And there are some concerns with the current bill, the original bill in place, or the lack of enforcement of it, where it, it gives federal government too much power. But because this was set to expire on September 30th, uh, the House Natural Resources Committee felt it urgent to pass something amenable that doesn't waste resources, but still keeps the program or fund afloat. So what this bill will do is require no less than 1.5% of annual funding amount for this or $10 million, whichever is greater, be used to secure recreational public access to existing federal public land for hunting, fishing, and other recreational purposes. So the Land and Water Conservation Fund is authorized at $900 million annually under this fund. However, these monies cannot be spent unless appropriated by Congress. Money going into this fund comes from three specific sources, you guys. The federal motorboat fuel tax the surplus property taxes and revenues from oil and gas leases on the outer continental shelf, which is very similar to this uh, bill that's going to correct the National Park Service backlog. So obviously many Republicans in this committee had cast out on the law's original application because they felt it didn't benefit local interests. And certainly there have to be probably further reforms enacted onto this so that the fund lives to its original intent. And I think Chairman Bishop communicated this really well. He said, creating outdoor opportunities for people was the reason Congress created the Land and Water Conservation Fund. He says that his reservations, my reservations about the program have never been about the goals of it. Rather, I've been frustrated that the implementation of the program fell short of the law's intended purpose. Despite the statute's successes and recognition of the benefit of using public land development to fund recreation and conservation investment, reform is needed to ensure 
LWCF benefits local priorities to the fullest extent possible. This bill, along with additional action we took today, ensures that Congress adequately funds the lands it already owns and realigns the fund back to its original goal of ensuring that hunters, fishermen, and families have access to recreational activities. I thank ranking member Raul Grijalva for his work to find common ground, and I look forward to engagement with all stakeholders and a Senate on a final agreement. So what does this fund do? I'm going to explain briefly, but DOI's website says this. The Land and Water Conservation Fund federal program supports the protection of federal public lands and water, including national parks, forests, wildlife refuges, and recreational areas, and voluntary conservation on private land. LWCF investments secure public access, improve recreational opportunities, and preserve eco ecosystem benefits for local communities. Basically, they use royalties from offshore oil and gas leasing to purchase private land to improve access to public lands, provide grants to state and local governments for public park projects, and pay for conservation efforts on private properties. This fund, since its inception in 1965, has applied to over 40,000 projects, uh, totaling about 41,999 projects, uh, with funding amounting to about $3.9 billion. So that's a lot of money for this fund. And all these three measures going to a vote, being implemented, and hopefully correcting the problems that are, that are currently facing established law or established backlog is good for conservationists, and it doesn't step on local interests. It doesn't impede people from hunting and fishing. So this kind of streamlining, again, of regulation and easing the processes of these laws and also making it easier for pe for less bureaucratic bloat to take hold is super important. We all enjoy public lands. We all enjoy access to outdoor opportunities. And that doesn't mean we have to have massive federal regulations blocking this, blocking access, blocking opportunities to explore things or uh, controversies preventing the places we cherish and love from being, being explored. So that was a very chalk heavy episode. And I think we accomplished a lot through this discussion very soon. You can expect maybe next week's episode, the week, the episode after that, I will be bringing on my first guest for the series. You'll find out who that individual he or she is in the time in a timely fashion. But I promise when that information is available and when I do that, you will be the first to know. If you want to do us a favor, if you want to see this podcast go everywhere, be heard by more people, please leave us a review on Google Play, iTunes, and other hosting services. Make sure you subscribe, follow us across social media on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We also have a YouTube account, which I haven't populated content to yet. However, we appreciate you guys following us. And if you want to hear something particular, if you guys want me to interview someone in particular for District of Conservation, please offer me your suggestions. I would love to hear that. So this is episode three. Thank you guys for listening. And we'll be back next week for a brand new episode. Have a good week.